Hello to you, I do hope you're well and welcome to this A-level religious studies revision session. I'm Ben Wardle and today we're taking a look at the design argument for the existence of God. So this video is designed for anyone taking the AQA exam and we will be looking at the two key AOs we need to know. We need to know our AO1 which refers to understanding and examining William Paley's design argument and then we also need to take a look at our AO2 which is of course all about evaluating so giving the strengths and the weaknesses of the design argument that Paley presents. We also will be focusing on critically considering the argument status as proof so we'll be looking at reasons people say it provides a really good source of proof. And then we'll be looking at the counter arguments. And we also need to look at the argument's value for religious faith. So whether it has a positive role to play in terms of people's religious faith or whether it does not. So we'll be looking again at both sides of that argument. In terms of where this fits in then on the AQA A-level specification, this is from paper one, which is of course when we talk about philosophy of religion and ethics. And as you can see there, it is the first topic, the teleological argument for the existence of God. Now, just before we get into the key content, I wanted to start just by going through the key terms. I think it's really, really important that we are crystal clear in our minds about the key terms and exactly what they mean so we can start using them in our discussions and, of course, using them in our exam answers. So the first key term we need to know, and they are in um, no order. I was about to say alphabetical order, but then I realised they are not. <laughs> So here is the first key term. It is analogy, which is an inference where information or meaning is transferred from one subject to another based on similarities or comparison. And of course, our focus will be on Paley's analogy of the watchmaker, the watchmaker argument. We need to know this is an a posteriori argument, and that is an argument which depends on sense experience. The best way to remember this word is to think a posteriori, it means post. Yes, yeah? so really focus on the word post within a posteriori. It means post experience, after experience. You see something, you experience something, and then you make your argument. And of course, that is in contrast to an a priori argument, which is made prior to or before sense experience. And the example we'll be looking at is, of course, the ontological argument. This is an inductive argument. And an inductive argument is one which supplies strong evidence, not absolute proof, for the truth of the conclusion. And therefore, it is probabilistic. So an inductive argument is made based on sense experience. It is based on the empirical observations you have made. And from that, you then make inferences. You then reach your conclusion. Now, you have to remember with an inductive argument in comparison with a deductive argument, it is supplying strong evidence rather than absolute proof. So that's really important to remember when we are evaluating this argument that it is an inductive argument. It is um, saying what is probably true rather than trying to give absolute proof, because when it comes to using our senses and using empiricism, there are no cast iron guarantees about the conclusions we are reaching. Our next key term, a really important one, is natural theology. This is the title of William Paley's book, but it's also a key term, and it's this. It's the view that questions about God's existence, his nature and attributes can be answered by using observation of nature in accordance with reason, science and history. So the word theology means the study of God or talking about God. And so natural theology means studying God or, you know, understanding God through nature, through the natural world, through observing the world around you. And that is the foundation for Paley's argument. The observations that he makes are the foundation for his argument. The key term inference then is a conclusion reached through evidence and reasoning. The word teleological, telos in Greek means end or purpose. So the teleological argument seeks to show that we can perceive evidence of deliberate design in the natural world, that there is a purpose behind it. 
We then have a couple of the omni words. So omnipotent means, of course, all powerful. And then omnibenevolent means all loving. And we'll be asking, what does this argument tell us about the nature of God? What attributes do we give him based on our experiences in the world he's created? Anthropomorphism, another really important key term today, and it means attributing human form or ideas to beings other than humans such as onto God. So the idea of God being a designer, are we anthropomorphizing God by comparing God to a watchmaker? Are you giving him a human presentation? Are you giving him human characteristics? Um, and a great link we can make there to when we talk about religious language and the use of language to talk about God. The anthropic principle then is the belief that the boundary conditions of the universe had to be fine tuned by God, otherwise intelligent life could never have developed. It's the idea, it's no accident that we are here. The world must have been perfectly designed to facilitate human life and human flourishing. And we'll be talking about F.R. Tennant and his anthropic principle argument. So here are the key scholars we will be meeting in today's revision session. We will, of course, be talking a lot about William Paley. He is the main man when we're talking about the design argument in this exam. We'll also be meeting David Hume, our key critic, and also Richard Dawkins, a contemporary atheist who wrote a very famous book called The Blind Watchmaker, in which he presents an argument that God did not create the world and that science can explain everything. We'll then be meeting John Polkinghorne, who was a very famous physicist and theologian. He was both a top scientist and also an Anglican priest. And he'll be saying that the design argument can still prove the existence of God. We'll be meeting Richard Swinburne, F.R. Tennant, Leibniz, and also Blaise Pascal when we start to talk about faith and whether the design argument, excuse me, has value for religious faith. So they are some of the key people, the key scholars, as we'll call them, that we'll be meeting in today's video. So I suppose we'd be better get on with it, haven't we? Otherwise, I'll just be here all day telling you about key terms and key scholars. What we really want to know is how to get that A star. So. I want to start off by asking you this question, and this question is really foundational for our understanding of the design argument, and it is this. Does the world show evidence of design? So when you look out of your window, as I'm doing now, as you look out at the world around you, do you see evidence of what we call design? And of course, we are making here empirical observations. We are using our senses to find things out to gain understanding and knowledge. So does the world show evidence of design? How about the human eye, for example, when you look at its complexity and the fact that all the different parts of the eye work together so well for a certain purpose, do we see in the human eye evidence of design? And there's some of the little bits of the anatomy of the eye, just to further illustrate my point there. How about when we look at creatures and how well designed they are for their environment and for their survival? Now, of course, Richard Dawkins will be giving the counter argument that we did not, um, or sorry, we are not designed for our environment, rather we evolved to it. And that's the whole theory of survival of the fittest and natural selection. But if you just take a look empirically, do you see in the way creatures are so well designed for their environments and their habitats? Do you see evidence of design there? How about fish? This is one of William Paley's own examples. The fact that fish and their gills are so well designed for surviving in water. For him, that is evidence of design. You know, he likes to talk about the fish. How about the seasons and the fact that every year we go through spring, summer, autumn and winter and all of nature works so harmoniously as it goes through that annual cycle of the seasons. And then how about when you take a look at the sky and you take a look at amazing landscapes and sunsets and beautiful scenes? Surely, William Paley says, that is evidence of design. All of this beauty, all of this complexity, all of this intricacy could not have just happened by chance. Surely it is evidence of design. 
So before we talk about William Paley, I just want to take one step back and talk about St. Thomas Aquinas. We know him as the doctor of the church. He rocked up in the 1200s and he came up with his five ways for proving the existence of God. And we'll talk about these more when we discuss the cosmological argument. But we just need to know for today that his fifth way of proving God's existence was his early version of the teleological argument. And Aquinas argues that the intricate complexity and order in the universe can only be explained through the existence of a great designer. And again, his argument is a posteriori. It uses empiricism. And Aquinas had an analogy of his own. He used the analogy of an arrow and an archer. And he said, arrows cannot reach their target or the target on their own. In the same way that the arch guides the arrow to where it is meant to go God guides natural bodies to where they are meant to go now this is not an argument named specifically on the specification we only need to know Paley's argument but it's really good to know the broader context of Paley's design argument and to understand that this idea of proving God's existence through observing design it, you know, it goes back a very, very long way. And as I say, to Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s um, and his fifth way of proving God's existence. So let's now talk about the main man himself, William Paley. His argument is, as we've established now, based on observation. It is what we call an empirical argument. It's based on what you can observe and what you can see. And it is therefore a posteriori. It is reached post experience you have the experience you make your observations and then you make your conclusion then you reach your conclusion afterwards and it's really important that you know it is inductive and makes inferences so remember with an inductive argument it is probabilistic rather than giving absolute proof really important to remember that he is making inferences based on what he can observe in the world around him. And these are the three things that he observes. So when I say the argument is based on his observations, these are the three observations that he makes. Really important you know this. This is key core AO1 knowledge. He observes complexity, he observes regularity, and he observes purpose. And remember, the term telos means purpose. So he is observing telos in the world, hence the fact he creates a teleological argument. Now, if you do download the PowerPoint at benwaddle.org, shameless shout out there for the website, <laughs> you will be able to print off this table and fill it in as we go through. Otherwise, I'd recommend you just, you know, however you organize your notes, make it really clear that there are three observations Paley makes that we are going to break down further now. So the first observation he makes, as I say, is complexity. Paley observes the complexity of the natural world, including the things within it. He looks at the complexity of biological organisms and organs, such as the eye, as we've said. He also looks at the complexity of the laws of nature by which everything is governed. So his first observation in his empirical argument is the complexity of the natural world, including the things within it. He also observes regularity. He observes in particular the regularity of the orbits of comets, moons and planets and the regularity of the seasons of the year. So he gets his telescope out and he sees the regularity of how every planet orbits the sun and how that happens with such precision in its annual routine. And then he also looks a little bit closer to home. He sees the annual seasons, those four seasons of the year and how they happen every single year. They work like clockwork. Just a little pun there referring to the watchmaker analogy. Um, and so that's really important as well. He's observing regularity. He's seeing routine. And this, again, leads him to the conclusion there must be a designer otherwise it would all be going crazy there would be none of this consistency this complexity this regularity or routine and finally he observes purpose Paley observes the machines that we make and infers that they are built for a purpose so you know he looked at the machines and he thought well you know they're made for a reason aren't they their complexity and regularity implies they have a purpose 
they serve a particular function. So, for example, a very, very advanced machine in Paley's day was the watch. And as we'll see in his watchmaker analogy, this machine is built for a purpose. It's built for the purpose of telling the time. And so our observation of the complexity and regularity of the world therefore implies the world also has a purpose. So basically, he observes purpose. Because things are so complex, because of the regularity he sees, there must be a purpose. And he's making that link between the machines of his day and the world as a whole. So on the basis of these three observations, Paley formulates this argument. This is the argument based on uh, regularity, complexity and purpose. Some objects in the world show clear evidence that they were designed because they exhibit complexity and regularity from which we can infer, so from which we can conclude that they were made for a purpose. The universe appears to exhibit the same complexity and regularity and so from which we can infer it was also made for a purpose. So, he concludes, it is likely that the universe was designed. Remember, it's an inductive argument. It is working in probability, not absolute proof. And so, in summary, Paley argues inductively from what we can see in the world back to the supposed cause. So, his observation of complexity, regularity and purpose leads him to the conclusion that the universe was likely to have been designed. And of course, Paley then tells us why it is God who he thinks must be the designer. And in a nutshell, it's because there is no other being or no other thing capable of um, designing a universe. So let me just share with you here the uh, primary source that we work with for Paley. As I say, the text is called Natural Theology. And he writes this in the text. In crossing a heath, Suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever. Nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. So Paley is asking you to imagine you've gone for a walk, you're in the park, you're having a lovely time and you come across a stone. You are not going to stop and think, how on earth did this stone get here? You're not going to do that, are you? Because you're just going to assume instinctively it has always been there. You're not going to question how did this stone get here? It is natural. It is there. We just know that it is there. As he writes, it had lain there forever. And nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. So that answer is perfectly acceptable. That is the assumption, that is the understanding we're all going to reach. But, he says, suppose I had found a watch upon the ground and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer I had given before, that for anything I knew, the watch might have always been there. There must have existed at some time and at some place or other an artificer or artificers who formed the watch for the purpose which we find it actually to answer, who comprehended its construction and designed its use. Now, his argument here, very, very simply, is that if you saw a watch or in modern day terms, if you came across an iPhone on the ground in the park, you would think there must be a reason it is here. There must be a designer who has planned it and then produced it for a purpose. And so he says there must have existed at some time a creator, a designer who created this for a particular purpose. And so this leads us to what we call Paley's analogical design argument. And I just need you to know before we de uh, dive deeper sorry, into this, that it's all based on inference. And so, just so you know, an inference is a conclusion reached through evidence and reasoning. An analogy, therefore, remember we're looking now at his analogical design argument using this watch example we've just read, is an inference where information or meaning is transferred from one subject to another. And in this argument, Paley is transferring his inference about the organisation and design of watches onto the organization and design of nature. Now, of course, we are going to look later at the evaluation points here, but the first question I'd ask you is, 
is he right to do that? Can you actually compare a watch to the entire world? Is that an appropriate comparison to make? Can that analogy work? So that's just something to start thinking about. But just at this stage, all you need to know is that he is transferring meaning from a watch to a world. He's using the point he makes about finding a watch to making a much bigger point about coming across the world. So let's break this argument down, shall we? And by the way, this image here, I Googled world's most expensive watch, and this is one of the pictures that came up, you know? So <laughs> just to give you a bit of background to my PowerPoint design there. So here's what we need to know about this analogical argument. He says, a watch has complex parts, each with a function, and the parts work together for a specific purpose. So, he says, the watch must have been designed by a watchmaker. Similarly, so this is where he then transfers meaning. The purpose has parts that function, the universe, excuse me, has parts that function together for a purpose. So, he says, the universe must have been designed by a universe maker. So just notice what he's doing here. He's talking about the watch and his conclusion about the watch. And then he's comparing it to the world and then making a conclusion about the world in terms of its complexity and in terms of this, this idea, this conclusion that there must therefore be a designer. And he says, the universe is a far more wonderful design than a watch. So its designer is much greater than any human designer. Therefore, the universe designer is God. So in the same way that a watch needs a watchmaker in order to have come into existence, he is saying the world needs a world maker in order to have come into existence. And the really important point is that that must be God, because God is the only being, the only thing, if I can use that term, that could have created an entire world because of God's omnipotence, for example. Nobody else, nothing else could have created and designed something with so much complexity that is so well designed and so extraordinary in its design. So he is using, and remember, this is what analogy is all about. It's transferring meaning from one thing to another. He is using his conclusions about the watch in order to make a point about the world. So it's an argument grounded in empiricism. Remember the conclusions he reaches based on his observations. And it is then an argument that uses comparison. It is an argument that uses analogy to help us understand the creation of the world. And here's another really important quote from natural theology from our primary source. He says, every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch exists in the works of nature, with the difference on the side of nature of being greater or more, and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. So he's saying every conclusion about design you make when you see a watch, you can make about the natural world, but on a much bigger scale, on a scale which goes beyond our understanding. So he's saying all those conclusions you make about a watch, you can make about the world. He's saying you can compare the world to a watch, but then you have to understand that the world's complexity and the world's design is on such a bigger scale times 100, times a million. And so you start with the watch and you shift all the way to understanding the entire universe. Now, we have support for this argument from F.R. Tennant, who proposed something called the Anthropic Principle. And he said that there are around 30 plus what he called boundary conditions that have to be fine tuned for an ordered universe containing intelligent life to develop. The odds against all those boundary conditions being at exactly the right settings are colossal. And so, he says, it seems that something must have designed it in order to bring about intelligent beings such as ourselves. So he is saying that there is evidence of design because this world is so perfect for us despite the odds of that being so incredibly low. So as he says, there are these 30 boundary conditions that had to be perfect in order to facilitate human life and flourishing. For example, the distance of the planet from the sun, 
if that had been the tiniest bit different, it would either be too hot or too cold for us. The force of gravity, of course, which enables us to keep our feet firmly on the ground. And then the expansion rate of the Big Bang. So all of these conditions had to be so perfect in order to facilitate human life. And he's saying the fact that against the odds, the boundary conditions have all aligned and human life therefore exists, that shows you evidence of design. That shows you there must be a sufficient reason that there is something and that we are here. And so FR Tenet's anthropic principle is a great piece of supporting evidence, if you like, for Paley's argument and his conclusions about complexity, regularity and purpose. So FR Tenant, the anthropic principle, a brilliant, brilliant supporting point when you're talking about the strength of the design argument, that these boundary conditions have been fine tuned and they have perfectly aligned against the odds. And this gives us evidence, and I'm using that word carefully, that there must be a designer. Something must have designed it because it's just too extraordinary and it's worked out so perfectly that it can't have happened by chance. We also have further contemporary support from John Polkinghorne, who we talk about on paper two when we talk about religion and science. As I say, he was a theoretical physicist and an Anglican priest. And he argues that science shows um, the universe is deeply intelligible, it's rationally beautiful, it's finely tuned for fruitfulness, and it is intrinsically rational. And he says, much like F.R. Tennant said, that these properties are not just happy accidents. It can't just be put down to a total coincidence. He says, actually, and remember, he's a scientist, he says the best explanation for this perfection is God. And his approach is evidence-based asking how what we observe may best be explained. And of course, with any inductive argument, it is not conclusive, it is not absolute proof, but it is highly suggestive. So John Polkinghorne, a contemporary physicist and priest, concludes the best explanation for everything that now exists is God. And that is, of course, evidence-based asking how what we observe, so what we can see, can be best explained. So the complexity, the regularity, the purpose, the best explanation for that is God. And so there's another strength of the argument, another piece of support that you can bring in to an essay when you are defending the design argument as providing proof for the existence of God. So just a quick knowledge check for you now. You might want to pause the video. If you have purchased the PowerPoint, you might want to print off this slide. I've got a couple of questions here that I think are really helpful for consolidating now your core knowledge about this argument. So I want you to recall, what is natural theology? What are the free observations that Paley based his argument on? Why does he think it is likely that the universe was designed? I then want you to have a go at summarizing his watchmaker analogy, and then how have a go as well at saying how FR tenants are anthropic principle, excuse me, support Paley's argument. So while I just have a quick, uh, quick sip of green tea, please do pause. You might want to print and have a go at this quick knowledge check. Okay, so shall we move on to some AO2? What I think is really helpful when you're studying and revising for your AO2 is thinking of your criticisms in this three-part table. So in the first column, we're gonna be looking at the criticism itself. So what is the headline of the criticism? We're really trying to be succinct and we're really trying to be clear about who made the criticism and what they said in less than one sentence. We'll then go into detail. We'll give our explanation of the criticism and, you know, as I say, refer to evidence that backs up their point and elaborate on their core criticism. And then also really important, although you can't see it right now, is looking at responses to the criticism. How would Paley defend his argument? How would a supporter of the design argument defend it from the criticism made? for example, by Hume or Richard Dawkins. 
So they are the three things I really want us to try and do today. Summarize the criticism, give an explanation of it, and then look at a response. How would you defend the design argument from that criticism? And again, if you click on the link below, you'll be able to get the PowerPoint and print off this table. So our first criticism, I can't keep saying that word, <laughs> I'm going mad, um, is from David Hume. And David Hume said, why not many gods? He said, the argument does not prove the existence of the Christian God. So let me break this down for you. He said that even if we grant that the universe was designed, there is no evidence that this was the God of Christian theism. The universe could have be, been designed by a lesser being or even by many gods working together. Furthermore, he said, the existence of evil and imperfection in the world suggests a limited designer, such as a trainee designer who has made a few mistakes in their design because they're just giving it a go, or even an evil designer, you know, a bit of a sadomasochistic God who enjoys creating evil and suffering so that people will, you know, have to struggle in their lives. So David Hume's argument is that, OK, maybe there is evidence of design, but how do you then reach the conclusion that the Christian God is the designer? So as I say, why could it not have been many gods working together? And David Hume uses the example um, of a shipmaker and the idea that, well, hang on, a watch might need one watchmaker. Yeah, OK, we get it, Paley. But he said, how about a ship? Because a ship is much more complex than a watch. And of course, the ship is not built by one man on their own because it's just not possible, is it? You have many people to make a ship. And so he says, if you need many people to make a ship, if you then think about the universe, surely you're going to need many, many more people or gods in order to make an entire universe. So how does Paley arrive at the conclusion that there is one monotheistic God who has created all of this? Now, Paley's response is going to be referring to the characteristics of God that he believes in, the idea that God is omnipotent, for example, the idea that God is omniscient. But I just want to share with you David Hume's primary source on this. And he says, but were this world ever so perfect a production, it must still remain uncertain whether all the excellencies of the work can justly be ascribed to the workman. If we survey a ship, what an exalted idea must we form of the ingenuity of the carpenter who frames so complicated, useful and beautiful a machine. And what surprise must we feel when we find him a stupid mechanic who imitates others and copied an art which, through a long succession of ages, after multiple trials, mistakes, corrections, deliberations and controversies, had been gradually improving. Many worlds might have been botched and bungled throughout an eternity ere this system was struck out. Much labour lost, many fruitless trials made, and a slow but continued improvement carried on during infinite ages in the art of world making. So what is Hume going on about here? Well, David Hume is saying here that this world could have been the last in a series of attempts made by God. God could have kept doing, through trial and error, different attempts at creating a world. And as he puts there, there could have been multiple trials, mistakes, corrections, deliberations, and controversies. You know, there could have been worlds that were botched and bungled, for example. And so he finally arrived at this world. And so he finally got it. He finally fine-tuned it. Here it is, the perfect product has been created. And David Hume is saying, even if you see evidence of this design in the world, how can you conclude that it is all thanks to a monotheistic, omnipotent, perfect Christian God? He's making the argument that this part of the argument is not sustained by evidence. You may be able to give evidence that the world appears to have been designed, but that evidence is not there when it comes to talking about the designer. And he then goes on to make another criticism. And this time he talks specifically about the watchmaker analogy. And he says that the analogy is flawed. So he says there is a big problem with the analogy itself because he says you cannot compare the world 
to a watch. You cannot make that link. You cannot make that comparison. And he says that the world is more like a vegetable that could have grown itself organically rather than a machine which has been designed and made by a human-like designer. So this is a great chance to talk about anthropomorphism. So let me break this down for you. He said the world plainly resembles more an animal or vegetable than it does a watch. Now, he's not saying the world looks like a giant floating carrot or a giant floating broccoli. But what he is saying is that the world could quite easily be compared to a vegetable rather than a machine. So vegetables, of course, as we know, are not designed. No one sketches out how the carrot is going to look and then designs it. The carrot grows. The broccoli grows. Vegetables organically grow on their own. And this is, of course, very different to a machine, which is man-made in a factory. It's designed. It's produced for a purpose. And then it's there in front of us. And his argument is that the world is more like a vast floating vegetable than a machine. Vegetables, as we've said, grow themselves without the need for a designer. So this world could have grown itself without the need for an external designer. In the same way that a carrot doesn't need a designer or a broccoli doesn't need a designer, the world doesn't need a designer. It could have grown itself. And so the analogy is fundamentally flawed. And we were saying before, weren't we, about the strength of an analogy? Can you use it? Does it work? He is saying transferring meaning from a watch to a world does not make sense because you cannot compare the world to a machine. And he said, to make an analogy between the designers of human machines and a designer of the universe is anthropomorphism. You project that idea of a watchmaker onto God and that anthropomorphizes God. This creates the image of God being this watchmaker character, which undermines, you could argue, belief in God. It creates this anthropomorphic idea of God. And so he says you need to avoid that. So just to summarize this key point, he's saying the analogy is flawed because the world is more like a vegetable than a machine. Now, I've put there in italics that there are similarities here with evolution, which is also not directed by any external agent such as God. So it's the idea that the world, the natural world is more like a vegetable than a machine that could have grown itself, that could have come into existence organically rather than needing a human-like, a man-like designer who um, planned it, produced it and manufactured it. So I think that's a really strong criticism, which really allows you to focus on the flaws of analogy, which demonstrates to your examiner, not only do you know the arguments, but you also are starting to consider, um, you know, how to critique. I'm going to say the word arguments again now. Do you know what I mean? You're starting to critique philosophical ideas as well, which shows the depth of your knowledge and understanding. Our next criticism, one of my favourites, is from John Stuart Mill, who says that actually all of that evidence you're claiming to have of design is flawed. Because, yes, Paley, you may be looking at how lovely the fish are. And, yes, you may be looking at the beautiful sunset. But you're being very selective in your observations, aren't you? Because Mill says, actually, I look out of my window, I look at the world, and I see a world filled with evil and suffering. And therefore, and this is really significant, the creator of this world would not be omnibenevolent. So even if this world has been designed, what kind of designer would create so much evil and suffering? And so Mill has this brilliant quote. I absolutely love this quote. He says, nearly all the things which men are hanged or imprisoned for doing to one another are nature's everyday performances. So all the things that you would be sent to jail for life for, nature does on a daily basis. He says nature kills. That's a really great soundbite as well. Two words. He says nature kills. If you look at the natural world, it's actually barbaric, cruel. You could say evil. It causes so much suffering. There is so much pain. We see so much bloodshed. It's absolutely barbaric. And he's saying, how can you look at this? How can you look at how cruel the natural world is and reach the conclusion that a omnibenevolent God created it? 
So as I write, J.S. Mill observes that the natural world is filled with pain and suffering. It therefore does not suggest the existence of an omnibenevolent creator, which is, of course, one of the key beliefs in Christian theism. This undermines the idea that our observation of the natural world leads us to belief in Christian theism. So again, critiquing, I can't even speak, excuse me, critiquing the conclusions of the argument, yeah? So moving from your observations of the world to a conclusion about a particular transcendent designer. The amount of evil and suffering caused by nature is irreconcilable with the idea of an all loving designer. Now, just very quickly, a Christian response here could be to invoke St. Augustine and original sin and the idea that God did design the world perfectly. But then Adam and Eve ate from the tree in the Garden of Eden, which brought about disharmony between heaven and earth, which brought all of the evil and suffering into the world. And so actually you know, there's a little defense. But here's the problem with that. This argument is saying that people today, when they look at the world, see evidence of design and should therefore conclude that the Christian God is the designer. And Mill's argument is that that is not the case. That is not the conclusion you will reach when you take a look at the natural world, when you see what nature is doing. So very quickly, here is a deeper dive into his original text into his primary source, which was called On Nature. So he said, in sober truth, nearly all the things which men are hanged or imprisoned for doing to one another are nature's everyday performances. He says, killing, the most criminal act recognised by human laws, nature does once to every being that lives. So if you kill somebody, you will be sent to prison, won't you? Well, that's something that nature does all day, every day. There are constant deaths. You know, the, the crime sheet against nature is getting longer and longer by the second because people are killed, animals are killed all the time from natural causes, so by nature. And in a large proportion of cases, that killing is after protracted tortures, such as only the greatest monsters whom we read of ever purposefully inflicted on their living fellow creatures. He says nature impales men. It breaks them as if on the wheel, a, a torture device. It casts them to be devoured by wild beasts, burns them to death crushes them with stones like the first Christian martyr, starves them with hunger, freezes them with cold, poisons them by the quick or slow venom of our exaltations, and has hundreds of other hideous deaths in reserve. Everything, he says, in short, which the worst men commit either against life or property is perpetrated on a larger scale by natural agents. So his argument here, in a nutshell, is that when you look at nature, nature is cruel. How can you use your observation of nature to conclude there is an omnibenevolent designer behind it all, that the Christian God has designed this world? Actually, when you look at nature, you should reach the conclusion it's designed by an evil designer who wants to inflict suffering, who wants to cause pain, who wants to torture people. That is not the God Christians worship and believe in. That is not a God J.S. Mill would think is worthy of worship. And so he's saying your observations of the natural world cannot lead you to belief in the Christian God, because this is the reality of nature. Yeah, Paley has been very selective about his evidence. He's been very selective about his observations. When you look at that natural world, it's cruel, it's barbaric, it's torturous, it's criminal. How can that be your evidence? How can that be the observation that leads you to belief in a Christian God as designer? So I think, you know, really hard hitting stuff there, really, really powerful as a criticism there for your AO2 arguments. I now want to bring in Richard Dawkins, who, as I say, is the author of The Blind Watchmaker, who I would say absolutely wipes the floor with this argument. And he does that using science. Now, remember, we've already met John Polkinghorn, who is a scientist who defends the design argument. Richard Dawkins is also a scientist 
but he takes, shall we say, a very different approach. He thinks that science disproves the idea of design because science tells us the appearance of design is actually the result of evolution. It is actually the result of natural selection. So, as I say, Richard Dawkins says, evolution and natural selection explain the illusion of design. There is no intelligent designer. And so whilst he would agree that, okay, you might appear to see design, or it might appear as if there is a designer, he is saying science proves there is not. There is a scientific explanation for why the world seems so perfect for human life. So here's what he says. He's a 21st century scientist and atheist who wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker. And when he says The Blind Watchmaker, he is talking directly about Paley's argument. So this is a great text to refer to. And he's saying blind watchmaker because he's arguing against this idea, of course, that there is this purpose behind the universe, that there is this intelligent designer behind it. He's arguing that there is no watchmaker. A brilliant quote from him is natural selection is the watchmaker. And of course, as we know, natural selection is not some intelligent conscious process. And so Dawkins believes that humanity needs to outgrow belief in God. He says science can now explain the appearance of design in the universe as being the result of Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection. Here's the key bit. The world was not designed for us. We adapted to it, which is why our species have survived. You know, we know this from our science lessons, don't we? This idea of adaptation of these random mutations over time so that giraffes have long necks so they can reach the branches, for example. So the idea is that the world was not designed for us, we adapted to us, to it, excuse me. And he writes, natural selection is the blind watchmaker, blind because it does not see ahead, does not plan consequences, has no purpose in view. So for Richard Dawkins, Modern scientific theories such as evolution disprove the design argument because they show the world was not designed for us, but we adapted to it over millions and millions of years through these random mutations. And of course, the key term there is random. There is no design behind it. There is no purpose in view, as he writes. It is a completely blind process that happens. And so, yes, it does appear we are so well designed for the world today, but that's only because we adapted to it over millions and millions of years. And if we hadn't, we would have died out. Our species would have gone extinct. And so that gives you all the answers you need. There is no intelligent designer. Everything is explained by science. Everything is explained by evolution and natural selection. And it's all the result of these random mutations over millions of years. We have adapted to the world rather than having it designed for us. And so, you know, if you want to critique uh, the anthropic principles, for example, here is a great way to do that. The idea that the boundary conditions were fine tuned for us, Dawkins would say is absolutely wrong. Yeah, over millions of years, our species adapted and evolved to the conditions on this planet, which facilitated our survival, hence the idea of survival of the fittest. One more critique for you now, a really great criticism from Bertrand Russell, who we will come back to later on. Um, and he said that the existence of the universe is simply a brute fact. And a brute fact just means a fact that has no explanation. It is just a brute fact. So he said, the existence of the universe is a brute fact, a fact that cannot be further explained or a fact that explains itself. And he asserted in a 1948 radio debate that I should say that the universe is just there and that's all. So he said, as human beings, we just have to accept that the existence of the universe is a brute fact. It is there and that is all we can know and that's all we should ever want to know. That fact should be our starting point. We should not be trying to go back and find out who was the designer or saying there was a designer. We simply have to accept, we have to start from the acceptance of the brute fact that the universe is there and that's it. That's the limits of our knowledge. That's all we need to know. And so that for him 
settles the question. There is no designer, there is no further explanation that involves gods and creation, none of that. The existence of the universe is simply a brute fact. It is just there and that's it, full stop. Now, a response to this is from Leibniz, whose principle of sufficient reason is that everything must have a sufficient reason for existing. So the principle of sufficient reason is a really great concept that we can draw upon in our study of philosophy. And it's the idea that everything must have a sufficient reason for existing. So the principle basically defines itself, doesn't it? And that it's the idea that anything in existence must have a reason for existing. Um, and Aristotle, one of our great founding fathers of Western philosophy, would support this because he said that men do not think they understand a thing until they understand its course. And so this principle here is saying there must be a sufficient reason that there is something rather than nothing. So you can respond to Russell's point there by saying, well, hang on, there must be a reason why there is something, why this universe does exist rather than nothing. Something must explain how it came into existence and why it exists. Now, this is also a great point to make in a cosmological argument essay. Um, and so... We, you know, we can absolutely transfer the criticisms across different topics on the course, always be making those synoptic links. But just for today, I want you to know, Russell says the existence of the universe is a brute fact. It's just there and that's all. And then Leibniz responds by saying there must be a sufficient reason for the universe existing. There must be a reason there is something rather than nothing. And of course, for Paley, the reason is there is a designer. So we now need to move on and we now need to look at two key questions AQA want us to consider. The first one is the status of this argument as proof and then the second one is going to be its value for religious faith. So what is the status of this argument as proof? Can this argument prove the existence of God which is of course the whole purpose of it? Let's have a look shall we? So on the one hand, you could say the argument does offer proof because it is an inductive argument. And most things that we accept as true in life today are based on inductive arguments. This is the normal way that arguments are made. Science, for example, is rooted in empiricism, isn't it? It's rooted in this model of making observations and then inferring conclusions from them. And so inductive arguments today are accepted as true beyond reasonable doubt. And of course, the stronger the evidence is for something, the more probably true a claim is. But you could argue the fact this is an inductive argument is consistent with how people attain proof of things in the world today. That inductive arguments are accepted and they are valued in the modern world. You could say about theists in particular that many theists may be satisfied that the argument offers proof and the reason is that it's consistent with their pre-existing beliefs and worldview. So if you already believe in God, you would probably say, yes, this argument does give proof because it's consistent with what you already believe. So, for example, it is consistent with what we read in Genesis chapter one, verse one, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you could say the design argument satisfies a theist as proof because it is consistent with what they already believe. If you think about um, religious language, for example, and Wittgenstein's language games, it is part of their form of life. It is part of their understanding and the way in which they understand the world. It fits in with their belief system. And so theists may see this argument as absolutely brilliant proof because it's a rationally and empirically based argument that can back up their religious beliefs. So they have their belief and then this argument, which is, you know, as we know, it is rationally and empirically based, can reaffirm them. It can help them defend their, their beliefs. And so a theist would absolutely, we could say, see this as offering proof. And then as a final thought, I've put there, the argument uses observation and empiricism. This is a popular way of attaining proof in the 21st century. It's been said we live in an age of epistemic imperialism for empiricism, that people in the modern world love to gain knowledge 
through using their senses and observation. And this is what the argument does. So its methodology is consistent with modern society's way of attaining proof. However, what could we say on the other side of the argument? As you can see, I've got a few more points on the right over here. So we could talk about arguments themselves and say that only deductive arguments can ever offer absolute proof. As we've said, the design argument is inductive, so it can never um, give you absolute proof. Only deductive arguments can do that. Um, Pascal says that the argument has little impact, and we're going to talk about him more in just a moment. Richard Dawkins, of course, has demonstrated significant flaws in the argument. He has given very powerful alternative explanations, and so its status of proof, as proof, sorry, is undermined, isn't it? We could say even if it is proved there is design, we cannot prove who the designer is. And so we could say this part of the argument requires faith. You know, as we've been talking about with Hume and with Mill, you may observe design, but what kind of designer does that actually lead you to understanding the world to have? And so you could say, you know, believing the designer is God, and in particular, the Christian monotheistic God requires faith. And I've put there, God as designer is not empirically proven by Paley. And so you could say that certain parts of the argument have better proof than others. And he's making this leap to belief in a transcendent creator, a transcendent designer. And that bit of the argument, probably the most important bit of the argument for him, is not supported by evidence. It is not sufficient as proof. Uh, we've already said this, but there are credible alternative explanations for the appearance of design. They undermine the argument status as proof. Remember, the stronger the evidence is, the more probably true a claim is. You know, when you start to give alternative explanations for something, the strength of the evidence is diluted, isn't it? It begins to be undermined. An atheist, for example, is unlikely to be satisfied by the design argument because these alternative explanations demonstrate the argument is outdated, you could say, it's incorrect, you could say, it is flawed. So if you don't already have a religious belief, if you're not already operating within the religious language game, this argument is not going to persuade you to join it, you could argue, because there are too many alternative explanations which undermine it. Whereas if you already operate within that religious form of life, that religious language game, you may be more likely to turn a blind eye to those alternative explanations because this argument is consistent with what you already believe. It confirms your pre-existing beliefs, if that makes sense. And then finally here, I want to talk about feedism and theists, fe no, not theists, I'm now making up words. I do apologise. Um, feedism or a feedist is someone who believes that you can gain knowledge of God through faith alone. So they are a theist, but this is important. They don't believe it's possible to know God through an argument such as the design argument. They say that belief in God and knowledge of God is about faith alone that's the whole point of religion that you're putting your faith in something you know despite the lack of evidence that's the whole point you cannot argue your way into the kingdom of god you cannot prove god's existence it is a matter of faith it is a leap of faith rather than something to prove if that makes sense so they would say that natural theology cannot lead to knowledge of God. It is impossible to know God in this way. Religion is a matter of faith rather than objective proof. You could link that in, actually, though, with what Augustine says about the fall and the fact that we are corrupted by the fall. You could say it is impossible for us to know God in this way because we are sinful. We are in a state of fallenness. And so we can only be saved. We can only know God through faith, for example, through faith in Jesus and his resurrection. And so you could argue that trying to prove God's existence in this way is impossible because religion is a matter of faith rather than objective proof. And so, as I say, Blaise Pascal, really important from the 1600s. He was a French mathematician and philosopher. And he said this, um, he said, metaphysical proofs for the existence of God are so remote from human reasoning and so complex 
that they have little impact. So he was very critical of arguments such as the design argument because he said they are so remote from human reasoning and so complex, they actually have little impact. So if you want a nice soundbite for your exam, you could quote Pascal as saying that arguments such as the design argument actually have little impact. So its status as proof is undermined because it actually has little impact. It is so remote, it is just insufficient. And so there's a nice little line you could throw in there to really impress your examiner. Let's talk then about the second question, which is about the value of Paley's design argument for religious faith. So what value does this argument provide for my religious faith? Well, if you want to say it does have value for faith, the first thing I would refer you to is John Paul II, one of the previous popes of the Catholic Church, and um, the 264th Pope of the Church. And he authored a very famous encyclical in 1988 called Fides et Ratio. And in this, he talks about reason and faith. And he asserts that reason and faith are mutually supportive. He says very famously, faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. So his argument is that as a theist, you can see reason, which is obviously what Paley is doing. He's using reasoning to prove the existence of God. And then faith are supportive of one another. They go together. And when you bring them together, as he puts there, the human spirit rises to discovering the truth. And so it is through faith and reason together that you arrive at the truth. And so this would say that the design argument has a really positive role to play in your religious faith. So it makes a really positive contribution. It's very valuable for religious faith because it brings together your pre-existing faith and then it brings in reason to support it, if you like. And when you bring those two things together, you rise to the contemplation of the truth, as he says. And so this argument complements faith Faith is beyond reason, he would argue, but is not contrary to reason. And so they come together in perfect harmony. So it has an absolutely valuable role to play in your religious faith. John Polkinghorne is there, of course he is. And he said that faith is motivated belief based on evidence. So you could say the design argument provides evidence for your faith or it gives you evidence to support your faith and your religious belief in God. So actually, it has a really positive role to play. You know, it's really, really valuable for your religious faith because you have your belief in God. This argument can give you the evidence to support that. Um, and the next point really goes into this in more detail. So I've put here, Paley's argument is rationally and empirically based. His reasoning and use of empiricism therefore provides strong support for theists. Um, it gives them, and I love this phrase, a reasoned defense of their faith. So you can say it really, really has extremely good value for faith because it gives a theist a reasoned defense of their faith. Your keyword there, of course, reasoned, it's using reason, and it allows them to defend their faith. So I think that's a great soundbite. That's a really great line to include. And of course, we link that to Wittgenstein and language games. And the idea that for somebody operating within that theistic form of life, within that religious language game, this argument is really valuable because it gives them, it equips them with a reason defense of their faith. So it gives them something to support them and to, yeah, give them an evidence backing, if you like, evidence-based backing for what they believe by faith. We could also say it is consistent with biblical teaching. It confirms biblical teaching that there is a guiding hand directing nature in a purposeful way. So it's really valuable for faith because it reaffirms what you already believe in based on religious scripture. And then we could also refer to H.H. H. Price and his idea of belief that and belief in. So Paley's argument gives evidence to support the belief that God exists. His description of the universe's design encourages belief in God. So it has a really positive role to play and it is really valuable for religious faith. 
However, on the other side of the argument, we could say it does not have value for faith. And these are your reasons why. Pascal said that faith is a matter of the heart, not just reason. He said, we know the truth, not only through our reason, but also through our heart. So you cannot um, argue for God's existence. It's something you have to believe in. And so the existence of God is not something that can be proved. We could also talk about fetism and fetus believe that rational arguments, as we've said, play no part in faith as they do not lead to commitment. So you can, again, not argue for God's existence. You can't prove God's existence. It is a matter of faith, not something to, as I say, to prove, not something that becomes a fact. Facts and faith are two very different things. And for a fetist, God will be judging you on the strength of your faith rather than whether you've proved his existence as a fact. And so belief in God must be based on faith alone. You cannot try to prove God exists in this way. And then finally, Paley's argument does not successfully address the problem of evil. And I've put here that this may restrict its value for faith in an omnibenevolent God. So as we said before, when we spoke about John Stuart Mill, you know, this argument okay maybe it says that is a designer but what kind of designer is the designer and so that part of the argument we could say requires faith and so this rational you know empirically based argument cannot help you to support if you like or sustain your faith in an omnibenevolent god in the christian monotheistic god and so this argument can only go so far. There is a point when it comes to religion that a leap of faith is required. And this argument cannot take you all the way to complete belief in a Christian monotheistic God. And so as I put, this may restrict its value for faith in an omnibenevolent God. And so just a final thought from John Polkinghorne on this, who said that faith is to be understood as motivated belief based on evidence. And based on that, I would say that the argument does have value for religious faith because it can provide people with a reasoned defense of their faith. But of course, on the other side of the argument, you've got the argument from fetism that it's about faith alone. And of course, you've then also got that argument that actually, you know, you, you can argue God's existence as much as you want, but at the end of the day, it's about taking a leap of faith. Religion is about faith rather than facts. It's about believing in something in spite of the lack of evidence, not because someone's been able to prove it for you. So it's, you know, it's a really central question of religion and science, actually, which we do talk about on paper too, don't we? And we're asking, well, is religion trying to be like science or is it trying to do something else? And for a fetist who believes in faith alone, it's trying to do something else. But, and sorry to jump around here, John Pulkinhorn is very much saying that faith is motivated belief based on evidence. And if you consider that point, you could say it does have value because it can provide a theist with the evidence. It can support them in their beliefs. It can give them that reason defense of their beliefs operating within their language game. Just very quickly, I wanted to share with you how this could look on the exam. So you could get a 10 mark question that asks you to examine Paley's design argument for the existence of God. And in that case, of course, you would be talking about his observations, those three observations. You'd be talking about his analogy, of course, as well. So you'd be setting out for me the key components of his design argument. Of course, you'd make sure you refer to the fact it's inductive, empirically based, a posteriori, and makes inferences as well. So all those technical terms about the actual logistics of the argument, if you like, and you could also get a 15 mark question, of course, where you're evaluating a statement. So the statement could say the design argument fails to prove the existence of God. And if you've got that statement, you would, of course, be giving me reasons it does fail. So you'd be giving me Richard Dawkins, David Hume, for example, John Stuart Mill. But then you'd also be defending the argument. So you might talk about F.R. Tennant and the Anthropic Principle, John Polkinghorne. 
and his defense of the design argument. And of course, she would be telling me about that theistic language game. And actually, if somebody does believe in God, then they would probably see this as really good proof for them. And of course, when you see the word prove in a question, you can bring in all those things we've just discussed about its status as proof. So a lot to talk about there, actually. I hope that's been helpful. I hope it's helped you with your studies and your revision. If you've got anything to add, any other key scholars or quotes you think are really interesting, please let me know in the comments. Always great to hear your ideas and insight. And equally, if you've got any questions, um, you know, anything that you would like a bit more clarification on, please, please leave a comment down below. Thank you for watching. Good luck with your studies and have a great day. Bye bye.